as her F3 Yolotl went steadily down towards the ocean. Asot highly considered that things had gone wrong in her life, like her fighter's engines doing far worse against a burst strike than expected, or the ejection seat not working, or the canopy refusing to pop off for a manual bailing out, or really joining the Republic of Darset Air Force at all and getting into this stupid training exercise. Yes, quite a lot of things had gone wrong. Spectacularly so. It appeared that Zayain Engineering was not all it was cracked up to be. Hopefully that luck would turn. But as the famously clear water of the eastern Otlio drew closer and closer, Aso Tiley didn't feel it would. Her F3 was a surprisingly good glider, but all gliders go downwards, ultimately. Overhead, two other F3 circled in order to keep eyes on as Aso Tiley went down. With them present, at least Asa Tiley could count on there being someone to watch as she drowned. She noted a shape on the horizon, playing through the waves. It was some sort of cargo vessel, and currently it was her only hope of survival short treading water till Sar arrived. Unfortunately, it was currently going the exact opposite way. Hopefully the crew would turn it around and come to pick her up. A brief radio conversation later and things became more clear. The ship was automated and couldn't really be overridden but it would immediately turn around the second she contacted water, responding to a beacon hail. That at least gave Asa Tiley better chances, but it would mean she would take a lot longer to get picked up. And, given her struggle to get the canopy off, meant there was still no one around to actually help remove the damn thing and let her escape. 100 meters to go. Controls were frozen, but there was a little bit of authority remaining. With all her might, every tentacle pulling on the controls, Asa Tiley struggled to keep the nose up for a ditching, 50 meters. Off in the distance, the cargo barge began to turn, so maybe her commanders had managed to get the owner to manually override it. More things to attend her death, she supposed. 25 meters. The aircraft shook as one of the f 3s circled overhead, far closer than it should have. Asa Tali would have yelled at the pilot for that, but she did have bigger issues on her mind, carrying on the fight with her controls. 15. 10. 5. The f 3 hit a wave of a smash, leaving Asatali feeling like she'd just been punched in the second stomach. The plane still had some momentum though, and so it skipped slightly, bouncing from wave to wave until finally coming to a stop. Asatali took a deep breath, before once again setting to work on the canopy. She unbuckled the straps keeping herself in his seat, and tried the manual release again and again and again. As she struggled, Asatali noted that the water was indeed climbing higher around her cockpit, or rather she was going down, steadily at least, but still down and still the canopy refused to budge. In desperation, Asatali began smashing at the canopy with her tentacles bored. Still no progress, as she noted the wings were very close to being fully submerged by this point. She had half a mind to get on the radio and yell at her fellow pilots to strafe the canopy, in hopes their bullets could break it, but the radio itself had given out an impact. And, being honest, they would probably just kill her faster, which under the circumstances only made it a better option. There was a new rumbling sound from straight up, Asatali looked up to see a new craft, one she didn't recognise, rocketing through the air above, its engines blazing away at full power in a struggle against gravity. For a moment, she thought it was going to hit the water, but the craft managed to win out, decelerating as it pulled up, until it was making a run straight at Asatali's sinking craft. Its red and yellow painted, transport helicopter-sized frame smashed past the circling f who pulled away in shock. If Asatali remembered her recognition charts correctly, this was a human craft, the US-22 dropship. Asatali hadn't expected them to show up, especially not before her own people's rescue planes. There were only a few United Nations vessels in system, present for negotiation purposes, while some of their personnel worked alongside the Republics, giving technical advice and so on. The Republic was pre-FTL, you see, despite having a few cities and Darcy's moons. The United Nations had been the only alien civilization to actually make contact so far, and they had been almost glacial about it. Step by step, Always careful to not scare the Republic, which was pretty good of them, all things considered. Then throwing a search and rescue craft at her, insignificant as a made her feel even better about their intentions. Even if she was about to drown. Maybe in the next life she'd be able to watch from the afterlife, at them doing more good things. As noticed, as she pondered this, that the water continued to rise. It was now at the very base of the canopy, and steadily clambering up the glass. An incredibly marching, up and up. Through some tiny hole, meanwhile, more water began to trickle, then pour into the cockpit. Asatali knew she was done for now. Either she could plug the leak, to sink all the way to the ocean floor and run out of air there, 
or let it continue to fill and drown here. Both were horrible options. As the water got to what could be called her ankles, and the canopy was almost entirely submerged, the human craft glided through the skies above. One of its side doors was open, and three shapes dropped from it, creating decent sized splashes as they hit the water in close proximity. Through the crystal clear water, as Atali could see shapes swimming towards her, their outline revealing them to be humans, though the large flippers attached to their legs did throw her off a little. All three powered across the waves, and were upon her ship in a matter of seconds. One placed themselves at eye level with Asatali, making a series of hand gestures Asatali didn't recognise, but she could guess by the context meant here to help. Asatali was about to make some sort of gesture back, but then realised the water was now around her arms. Worse, the influx of water was accelerating. Unless these people moved fast, she was done for. Training took over. Asatali remembered the procedure now. Take as many deep breaths as you could before you fully submerged. As she filled all four of her lungs with the contents of her rapidly shrinking air pocket, Asatali used her free tentacle to gesture in the direction of the exterior emergency release, though she could just see that the other two figures were already over there. Then the water was upon her, and she had no choice but to wait. There were several seconds of nothing, then a bang that shook the sinking plane. Asatali could see the canopy shatter under the pressure of the inlaid micro-explosives, the figure having backed off before they could get injured. Asatali began to swim upwards, only for said figure to grab her around her midsection, wrapping their arms around Asatali's tentacles. Then the figure propelled both of them straight up, breaching the surface in no time. A moment later, the other swimmers popped up. The human dropship came around once more, this time even lower. A winch lowered from that small side door, with a human and a rescue harness dangling from it. The dropship manoeuvred precisely to put said human down right next to Asatali, at which point they began to the dropship precisely manoeuvring to put them down right next to Asatali and her helper. The human then quickly applied the harness, looping cables around some of Asatali's tentacles to get a firm hold. It was clear they weren't used to working with the Zayang body, given how gently and cautiously they completed the task, as opposed to the rough and quick of a seasoned worker, but they did it without hesitation. The human made a gesture up at their craft, sticking the largest digit of their left hand up as they shouted something into their radio. Asatali guessed that the crew of the dropship couldn't really see the gesture, and the radio was absolutely doing the majority of the work, but it was probably near religious tradition at this point. Then they were lifted up, hoisted out of the seas. It only took a short time to climb that distance, and yet Asatali spent every half second in fear. Fear that the line would break, the plane would experience its own fault, or the winch would stop. And yet none of these came to pass, with Asatali being bundled into the dropship safely, whilst another human untangled her from the straps. A pair of medics appeared, assessing any injuries whilst the rest of the team were rapidly retrieved. Someone told her that a beacon had been placed, so the wreck of her jet could be located and recovered. Then, in so little time, she could feel the dropship begin to zoom off, this time heading straight for land. The medics checked her over, but she had nothing worse than some bruises from the impact. As they flew, one of her rescuers apologised profusely for their lateness arriving. Apparently they had been running a training exercise just a few hundred clicks away, and had immediately beelined over the second they had been informed of the situation. Just casually find a search and rescue craft faster than her fighter could ever dream of going, in order to pick up a random pilot in the nick of time. Asatali reckoned she liked these humans. <laughs>